Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you are humanity's only hope, and it's only by your grace that we are saved. And we praise you and we thank you for laying your life down for us to redeem us. And Father, I ask and I pray that as we get into a time of studying your word, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And I pray for all of us who are here, all who are watching, all who will watch. And I ask and pray, Father, that each of us would respond to you today. For those who are unsure of where they stand with you, I ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would do that glorious work that only he can do, that there would be salvation today, that there would be clarity, and people would leave knowing where they stand with you, that they have a right relationship with you, that they would receive that free gift of salvation. And Father, for those of us who profess your name, I ask and pray, Lord, that you would ignite us, Father, that our hearts would burn for you, that your word would burn inside of our bones, that we can't keep it to ourselves, that we want to share the good news with everyone. Help us to see people, Father, through your eyes. I ask and pray that you would be glorified in this time of study. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll do this one more time just to make sure, because I know that I'm piggybacking on what Diane has already mentioned, but Skyla, just raise your hand again. I want y'all, everybody look around, look back at Skyla, not look around at Skyla. She's still, she will be right there. You see her? What happened in terms of these adults and their, praying for what it, their, God's will was for children it was stunning. We just sat back and watched, and the Lord moved and worked, and there was no pushing of anything, and it was just very clear that's what he's doing, and we need a few more workers, a few teachers, and a few helpers, and I'm just going to ask you again, before you leave, you're not, you're not even committing, but if you're just open to saying, you know, I'm open to exploring that. Please let Skyla know, and just that would mean the world to us, because we're excited what the Lord has for our children, for our families, as they learn about our King and what it means to live for Him, what it means to share with others. So you pray about being a part of that. And there's also an incredible opportunity, which you'll hear about later, to impact our community at that welcome desk. And I would encourage you to check that out and to pray about signing up for that. And lastly, I want you to pray about not only being here next week, but also continuing to pray for who you're supposed to share the good news with and who you might invite to services. This series that we're in is very intentional. It is set so that you might be able to invite someone who is unsure of where they stand with God uh, to hear the good news. Have you ever had that nagging sense that God has some business with you? But you're not sure what it is and you're trying to figure it out can't put your finger on it, but there's just something there. And the answer is really for probably almost all of us is that yes. And that, that usually starts with salvation. And that is that, that sense in which we start to, to, to realize there's something missing. And that's the Holy Spirit at work in us. There's something that has to happen. And we're not sure what it is. And we have an idea that it has something to do with God. And, and we're trying to process that. And some of you may well be there right now. And that often also goes on throughout our lives. As we walk with God, there's a sense in which God calls us. And so when we talk about the calling of God and God laying things in our hearts, sometimes we're wondering, God, what are you doing and why? And I would encourage you, instead of pulling back, to lean into that because God is at work and his Holy Spirit is at work and he has something for you. Don't pull back from him. But rather say, Lord, what is it that you want? What are you saying? And I want you to please Think through that today as we get into this message. Maybe some of you are here today and you don't even know where you stand with God right now. If I were to ask you, where do you stand with God right now? Some of you might well say, I'm not sure, or I think I'm good. I hope I'm good. And I've heard that a lot. And that's a very common thing with people. And and, and I want you to know that that, that the good news is so great that you don't have to wonder. You can know, and I'm not trying to sound like that old school evangelist. You can know that you know that you know. 
And my prayer for you is that today you would leave and that you would know where you stand with God and that you would know that you have received that free gift of salvation and that you are made right with God. So I'm asking you to think through that and to pray through that as we walk through this text. Some of you aren't even sure why you came today. Like, I don't know. I just felt kind of led. I don't know. It was a weird thing. Some of you are watching. I don't even know why I tuned into this church. Well, the Holy Spirit, he works this way. He draws. You can either be responsive or you can resist him. And I would encourage you to not resist him because the more you and I do that, the harder our hearts become. Our text today really addresses these issues. If you have a Bible or your Bible app, <coughs> and if you don't, the text will, not now, but it will be on the screen in a bit. Um, oh, and by the way, if I talk too fast, I'm trying hard. You know where I'm going. When, you ever had prednisone? Okay, I'm on a lot of it right now. And um, I was, yesterday, Hannah and I were walking, my daughter, and she looked at me with this, like, look on her face, and she said, Dad. And I go, what? you got to slow down. And I said, what? I can barely understand. You can't preach like that tomorrow. And so I mean, last night's sermon, so I was trying so hard last night, and I gave them a heads up. I get excited when I preach about the Word of God anyway because I just am blessed that the Lord would grant me the privilege to do that. So if I get, like, really hyper and going fast, I have... I'm trying hard to focus to not do that, but if I do, you can feel free just to kind of go, not all of you, because that would be very, but you can just kind of go, I'm not intending to, but yeah, the prednisone right now is like racing through uh, my body like crazy, but uh, the t our text, we're in John 3. In your Bible app, you can go there. The text will be on the screen, and, and this is, it takes place during the first year and a half of Jesus's ministry. It's around the time of Passover, and Jesus is in Jerusalem. And, and he's done something very significant, something very uh, scandalous in many ways. He has just cleansed the temple. He's cleared it out. He drove out the money changers, the merchants. And this wasn't a polite thing in our terms. I mean, this is scandalous to us. We tend to think of Jesus as being this, this little pasty, willowy, 60s flower child who was like, oh, everybody. no, he drove people out with whip, with a whip. He was flipping over tables. This was a righteous anger. This was his father's house. And I say, man, what's he upset about? You can imagine the chaos. The, the people were stunned because they're used to these money changers and these merchants being there, especially during Passover. And then Jesus says something amazing. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise, literally a house of marketplace or trade. So what is Jesus so upset about? The abbreviated version. You have money changers and merchants who were taking advantage of the poor and of travelers. They were ripping people off, making a profit off people who had to pay the temple, the temple tax. You see, there were certain coins you had to use. There were only two types that were accepted. And so they would make a lot of money off that money exchange. And people also who traveled far from across the empire, and it was too far to bring an animal to sacrifice. And so they were ripping them off, and they were taking advantage of the poor as well. So this was not a good situation. Jesus' anger was not that there was some kind of a service being provided to help people. His anger was directed that these merchants and these money changers were ripping people off in the name of God. This was a money grab in the name of God. And guess what? That's really offensive to God. And in the off chance, that any prosperity preacher is watching, please take note. That's really offensive to God, stealing and taking advantage of people in the name of God. So some of the Jews that see Jesus doing all of this, I mean, you have to imagine what this is, they're used to certain things happening in the temple area, but certainly not people being driven out with a whip and tables being flipped over. And so they, they look at him and they're dis, in disbelief and they say, by what authority do you do this? In other words, show us what kind of authority, who are you? Why would you do this? And then Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You see, he wasn't talking about the physical temple itself. There's two different conversations taking place. He's talking about his body as a temple. 
that he himself would be the sign, his death, burial, and resurrection. But they didn't understand that. Again, they're having two different conversations. They thought he was crazy. So they look at this temple, this magnificent temple, and they say, it took 46 years to build this temple. And you can hear people in the background going, think of all the manpower, all the hard work, and all the materials, and you're going to do it in three days? They didn't understand. They were focusing on the physical, and Jesus was talking about something much, much greater. And that's going to be a big part of the conversation we're going to look at today. The same thing, Jesus having one conversation and the person not understanding trying to understand, but thinking in different realms. Among uh, the people in the the city of Jerusalem, news would have traveled of this very rapidly. Everyone would have heard about it. And among them was a very religious man, a religious man. Now, I want you to please hear this. Some of you are very religious, no doubt. Now, I don't know your hearts, so I'm not, please know when I say this, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, all right? This can be anybody watching anywhere, anyone here. You can be really, really religious. Long story short, your religion cannot save you. Your external religion will not save you. No matter how many good things you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how moral you are, that will not save you. That will not make you right with God, and we'll we'll see why in a moment. Among those who would have heard was a very religious man, a Pharisee, who was an expert in the law. He was very prominent. He was a very respected teacher. We know this from chapter 3, verse 10, because Jesus actually refers to this man as the teacher of Israel, which means that this man was considered a sort of master teacher, meaning that rabbis and other Pharisees would, would come to him for answers when things were too complicated On God's word, he knew the word of God. Another note, you can know a lot about the word of God without actually having a relationship with God, without actually knowing God. Don't confuse your religiosity, your religion, your morality, or the things you may know about God with actually having a relationship with God. This man was also a member of, of, uh, he was a ruler of the Jews, meaning that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish ruling council. So he is greatly respected. He's very, very bright. He knows what we might say. He knows the Bible. And he also had great status. After this temple incident, he, he seeks Jesus out. And I'm not sure if it's because of the temple incident or it's the cumulative effect of that plus all that he has heard about Jesus. So in John chapter 3, if you haven't guessed by now, the man we're, we're, we're looking at today and we're going to focus on is a man named Nicodemus. Now some think that Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night, at the nighttime, because he, he doesn't want other people to know. He doesn't want people to, to know that that's why he, that he's doing this, because that would be scandalous. And here he is uh, with all of his position, going to someone like Jesus, who is already a polarizing figure, but that's not said in the text. We, we can infer that's a possibility. But it's also just as equally likely that he just heard Jesus was nearby one night and decides, I'm going to go have that talk now. What I can tell you is, is that throughout this conversation, you get the very strong sense that Nicodemus can't explain why, but he just knows he has to talk to Jesus. For some reason, he has to talk to him. Again, that's maybe where some of you are. You don't know why, but there's this something like, I know, I, there's something God wants from me. He has business with me. I think this is what's going on with Nicodemus in his life. This is the Holy Spirit at work. We don't know why he comes at this time, but we know that he needs to talk. He seems to need answers that he believes only Jesus is going to be able to give him. So we get to the text We're not going to do the entirety of the conversation that he has with Jesus. I wish we had that time, but let's start with verse 1, and we'll go uh, into verse 15. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, 
again, Nicodemus has knowledge of Jesus because he's just talking about the things that he has been saying and doing. So he maybe he knows some of his miracles, some of his teachings. He certainly knows what he did in the temple. But he starts off his conversation with, no man can do the things you're doing unless God is with him. So he's aware on some level of, of some of the things that Jesus is doing. And he also is doing this as a polite way of introduction. So there's certain protocols for how one would greet uh, another person to be proper, particularly if, if, if you are talking about someone in this religious sphere. So he's starting off very polite. You'll notice he also refers to Jesus as rabbi, as a teacher from God. So he does have some respect for him. But he's also intrigued by him. But Jesus knows there's a lot more going on with Nicodemus and these polite formalities. He knows that Nicodemus has a really great need that he's just not aware of. And he doesn't know what to do with it. And that's where maybe some of you are. You have a great need. There's a gnawing inside. You say, what do I do with that? So Jesus, as he did with others in the Gospels, and we'll see this again next week, instead of just exchanging polite formalities and just gradually unfolding, goes straight for Nicodemus' heart. You know, Nicodemus starts off with a very nice and polite introduction, right? Let's see how Jesus responds. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus didn't ask anything about the kingdom of God or being born again, did he? Nothing. That's the very first thing that Jesus said to him because he knows that's Nicodemus' real need. You must be born again. That's not only true of Nicodemus. This is a statement that is true for all people at all times. For some people who not for, aren't familiar with the scriptures, they think that that term born again was something that maybe Billy Graham invented in the 70s or some kind of church talk. No, this is biblical. These are the words of Jesus. You must be born again. That's for everyone. That's for everyone. Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, meaning you will stand condemned in your sins, separated from God now and throughout eternity. There is no forgiveness unless you're born again. You must be born again. So I would ask you first, and I will ask you again a few times, have you been born again? Are you born again? You might be saying, I, I don't know. I hope so. Again, you can know. And we can nail that down. You can nail that down. Hang in, please. Some of you are saying, I don't know her. Or how can that happen? That's exactly what Nicodemus was wondering. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a, a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So here we have two conversations taking place again. Nicodemus is thinking of the physical realm, and Jesus is not. How can someone, you can just see Nicodemus trying to wrap his mind around what Jesus said, you must be born again. How can that happen? How can you be born twice? How can someone be old and then experience birth again? That's impossible. It's impossible. Just like it would be impossible to go into your mother's womb and to be born again. He's not arguing. He's trying to understand. And Jesus continues. He doesn't answer this question, but he continues to explain the necessity of the new birth. Meaning, what we're about to read, he's saying to Nicodemus in so many words, this is absolutely necessary, Nicodemus. It is necessary for you, and it's necessary for all of us. Are you, have you been born again? Verse 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You get the sense that Jesus is pretty emphatic on this statement, you must be born again. He's very emphatic. You must. There is no other way. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. There's a lot going on in verses 5 through 8. And we could spend a long time here. That's an entire sermon itself. So I'm going to give you some big picture things. What is he referring to? First, the water and the Spirit. What does that mean? 
What is he talking about in verse 5, water and spirit? There are some interesting interpretations. Linguistically, it's important for us to understand this. The sentence here is referring to one single event. One single event, spiritual birth. Now, some try to use this and say, you see, baptism is necessary for salvation. A couple of problems with that. Christian baptism has not yet been instituted at this point. It hasn't. That command to do, be baptized after one is a follower of Jesus has not even been commanded yet. So this would have made no sense for Jesus to have said, and Nicodemus wouldn't have understood it at all. Some will say, well, maybe it was the baptism of John, the baptism of, of repentance. But you see, nowhere else in the Gospels is Jesus calling anyone to have that baptism. So this is not talking about a physical baptism in water and something that the Holy Spirit does. And the context tells us something very important. This is the, the key here. Jesus expects for Nicodemus to get the reference of water and spirit. He fully expects a man who is an expert in the word to understand what he's talking about. So we have to dismiss that idea of baptism saves you, which it does not. And whenever you're developing uh, you're, whenever you're looking at theology, you must always use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So when we take the entirety of Scripture, what does all of the Scripture have to say about baptism? Baptism doesn't save you. What does all the entirety of Scripture say about salvation? It says that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It is a free gift. So just hang on to that. Again, Jesus expects this teacher of Israel to completely understand the reference to water and spirit. Why? There are Old Testament passages where the terms water and spirit are linked together, and they always refer to the outpouring of God's spirit and spiritual cleansing. You see this in Isaiah. You see it in Ezekiel. Spiritual cleansing and purification of the soul. Nicodemus should have known this. When I talk about a man who would have known the scriptures, as I said before, by that the old, what we would call the Old Testament, were we to have a Bible drill with Nicodemus in the Old Testament, he would crush all of us collectively. Now, these people, this, this man was an expert. He knew the word. And again, you can know a lot about the word and completely miss God, and that's really scary. Nicodemus should have known this, and Jesus will continue to point back to things that Nicodemus should know to give Nicodemus an opportunity to understand. This is what Nicodemus needs to be born, again, that spiritual cleansing, because and all of us do, because all of us are sinners by nature. We're all dead in our sins. The new birth is that cleansing in that our sins are forgiven. We're made alive in Christ. We become new creations in Christ. Are you born again? Do you know? Verses 6 through 8, Jesus is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, how he moves, what he does. He's talking about God's sovereign work of saving people. It is the work of his Holy Spirit. So it's not a work that we do. We cannot earn our way to a right relationship with God because all of our works are as filthy rags before a holy God. God is holy. And his standard isn't pretty good. His standard is perfection. And we all fall short. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the scripture. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, look that up. Our works have nothing to do with it. Why can't we cannot add to anything that Jesus has done? Jesus lived the perfect life that we cannot live to offer himself up willingly as the perfect sacrifice for us. And on that cross, he cried out, It is finished, it's paid in full. You and I can't add to anything that Jesus has done. And isn't that arrogant on our part to think that we could? Jesus, yeah, I know you did all this stuff for me, but I got to do my part. He's done it all. Salvation's a gift. That's why the cross is in part a stumbling block, because we tend to think that we have to earn, be good enough to earn You'll never be good enough before a holy God. 
He's talking about God's work here of the Holy Spirit. We don't do the work of the Spirit. If God does it, he does it graciously, mercifully. He leads us to repentance, to faith in Christ, to being born again. And Jesus is comparing him now to the wind. Just like you can't see the wind, you can see the effects of the wind. You can't see the Holy Spirit and what he's doing, but you can see I mean, you can't see the effect of what he does. The Holy Spirit moves where he wills to move, and he does what only he can do. He changes lives by leading people to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the one who does this. And Christians, you know this already, and I'm going to tell you why you already know it's the Holy Spirit's work and not the work of man, not the work of, uh, of, of anyone but him why do you pray for your lost friends, family, and co-workers? Because you know it's only if God does the work that the heart's going to change. It's not about your technique or my technique. We're not, out, we're not salespeople trying to get people, you know, ABC, always be closing, right? There's, well, some, sadly, there's some preachers that, that believe that. They'll say anything to manipulate the emotions to get someone to do something. But what we want is we want to see people come to saving faith. That is the work of God. And I want to see you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, not because someone made you feel a certain way, but because the living God did a work in your life. If you get back to our text, Nicodemus understands the law. He understands the word of God, but not the ways of God. And that's the great danger for the really religious people is that confusing our knowledge of God, but truly knowing God. And so Nicodemus is listening to all of this. And in verse 9, he says, how, how can these things be? Someone who knows so much is so confused. How can this be? And again, Jesus expected him to understand because look how he responds to him in verse 10. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Nicodemus, you know so much of God's word and this has been staring at your, in you in the face your whole adult, your whole scholarly life, your whole religious life. How have you not understood? How could you have not understood that you need to have a new heart, spiritual cleansing, a new birth? And then Jesus goes on to say, not only have you not understood the very word that you're an expert in, but you've also not yet understood, nor have you believed the things that you have heard about me. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Meaning, I'm telling you the truth, as are my followers and those who truly believe in me. We are speaking truthfully. We bear witness about the things that we have seen, that the kingdom of God is present. But you, and the you is plural there, and those you lead do not believe us. You do not receive our testimony. He says, if I've told you earthly things, things that happen in this sphere of life here on earth, namely the new birth, you're born again here. If you're, if you're going to be born again, it's going to be in this life. There is no second chance. If you don't understand this now, he says, how can I tell you about heavenly things, meaning the deeper things of God? That's what's going on here. He's addressing Nicodemus at the point of his unbelief. He knows all these facts, and he has heard stories about Jesus. He knows enough, but he doesn't truly believe. Oh, yes, you can know a lot about Jesus in the Bible, and you can be around believers a lot. You can hear a lot of truth. You can hear how God works in the lives of people. But again, that won't save you. You must be born again. Are you born again? Verse 13, Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And this is a remarkable thing. Again, Jesus is pointing back to uh, texts and the passages that Nicodemus should know to say something remarkable about himself. He's saying, no man can or has ascended into heaven to learn the heavenly truths that I know and that I speak of. He's saying something pretty significant here, but I'm the exception. I came from heaven, meaning I descended from heaven, referring to the incarnation. He's making a stunning claim about himself to Nicodemus. I speak of heavenly things because I am from heaven. 
No one else has except the Son of Man. That's Jesus' favorite designation for himself. And that also should have grabbed uh, Nicodemus' attention. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, Son of Man is a messianic prophecy. Again, Nicodemus should have known these things. So here is Jesus saying that he is the Son of Man who's come down from heaven. And all of this had to have caused Nicodemus to pause to consider what is he saying, what's going on. And all these references that he would have known or should have known, the Spirit of God would be taking and helping Nicodemus to try to understand. And we'll stop in this next section because Jesus will now point back to another Old Testament story. One is very well known, especially to a very... uh, religious expert like Nicodemus to tell Nicodemus more about who he is and why he has come. Verse 14, and as Moses, think about it, Nicodemus just sits down for a, a, like probably a little probing conversation, right, to find out a few things. Hi, how are you? Rabbi, respected teacher, no longer do the things you're doing. This is sent by God, and Jesus is just going right for the heart. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And you might say, well, what is he talking about there, that serpent thing? Write down Numbers 21. Read that later. He's pointing back to a, an incident that happens in Numbers chapter 21. And then he points to himself saying, all of that foreshadowed me. And that also had to blow Nicodemus' mind. You see, what happened in that event, the Israelites, specifically the generation that was born in the desert, the one that was going to inherit the land, had just had their very first military conquest over the Canaanites. God gave them victory. But they're still in the desert. And they start to grumble. And they start to complain. Which you kind of find that a lot in all the stories after the Exodus, Right? So here they are again, and now this is a generation that's going to inherit the land. They just, God has just given them their first victory. But they're starting to grumble. They're still in the desert. Literally, this is what's going on. They're saying, they're still eating this bread. I'm tired of it. They start to grumble against God, grumble against Moses. Can you imagine God's people grumbling? Why are you laughing? Oh. That's one of those little sins we tend to dismiss. You might say, sin? Wait a minute, God's not a sin. You see, God is faithful to his people. And what he was doing, no matter what he did, they tended to fall back into grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining is a reality. Here's the problem with it. It is a direct attack on God's goodness, his faithfulness, and it does not please him. So we run around grumbling. Instead of praising and thanking God for his goodness towards us, his blessing, we focus on the things that aren't going our way, and we grumble, complain. We complain about this person, that person, we, and we, we write it all off. We spiritualize it. Well, it's because he did that, or she did that, or it's because I don't have this, or I want this, and why do they have that? I don't have it. On and on and on and on and on. And guess what? That is an offense against a holy God who has given us every good and perfect gift. I don't think most of us believe that. They grumbled a lot, these people did. So God had to discipline them. Man, this is my nightmare. The way he disciplines them, he sends a mess of snakes their way. And a lot of people are bitten and poisoned, and they're not going to make it, and many die. It's scary. These people need to be healed, or they're going to die. And then the people in their fear, as often happens, leads them to some kind of repentance, and they come to Moses, and they say, pray for us. We've sinned. We spoke against God and you. Confession of sin is absolutely necessary for the forgiveness of sin. People ask Moses to pray, God, take these serpents away. So Moses prayed. And then the Lord tells Moses to build a bronze serpent, one resembling the serpents that were plaguing the people. And he puts it on a pole. And he told them to raise that up. And all who would be healed to look at that. And they would be healed. By looking at the serpent, they had to face what they had done. They had to face the cause of their pain, their sin. But in that act of obedience and faith, they were healed. And then Jesus takes that and points to himself. As the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Just like Moses lifted that serpent up 
the Son of Man, I must be lifted up so that whoever believes in me would have eternal life. And that reminds you of what comes in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whosoever believed in him, didn't work for him, but believed in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus would be lifted up and he would be in a brutal, a cruel way. God the Son beaten and bloodied, naked, nailed to a cruel Roman cross. His shame there, that's our shame, our sin. That should be us on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of Christ. He endured God's holy, righteous wrath against our sin as it was applied to his account so that we could be forgiven. That's why he could cry out it is finished he paid for your sin for my sin for all of it have you been born again we're only born again by coming to faith in jesus jesus alone saves us so Jesus tells Nicodemus a lot, this religious expert, this brilliant mind, this man who likely couldn't explain why he came in Jesus, except that I just felt I had to. It was the Holy Spirit working on him. A lot of us, when we look at Nicodemus, we want to know the rest of the story, so to speak. Did Nicodemus ever come to saving faith? Did he? Now, and when you walk through that encounter in chapter 3, he doesn't indicate anything there but there are some things that lead most scholars to believe that he does we know first of all from john 7 50 through 52 that nicodemus takes a stand for jesus amongst the religious leaders at some point and that's not saying that it saved him but it may well be an indication that he took that stand because he has been born again. In John 19, he risks his reputation and also his standing. Some might argue even his life by helping to provide a proper burial for Jesus. He wants to make sure that that happens. Beyond that, in Scripture, we don't know. But what's interesting, there are several early church traditions, and by that very early church traditions, that say Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus and because he did, he lost his position as a Pharisee. He was kicked out of the ruling Jewish council, which was the Sanhedrin, ultimately banished from Jerusalem by the religious authorities when persecution of Christian broke out. Christians broke out. If those things did happen, I would say this. Nicodemus, the man who met Jesus at night, wouldn't have had any regrets. He would have counted that a joy, Because he knew Jesus. He would have finally have found the peace he longed for if this happened because he was born again. He would know that he was forgiven, that he had a relationship with God, and they could take away his position, they could take away his promise, they could take away everything, but they could never take that away from him at all, his salvation. And if that is true of him, or was true of him, let me tell you, it's true for anyone. You place your faith and trust in Christ. No one can ever take that from you. No one. And he will never let you go. He who began that work in you will be faithful to complete it. So I'm going to ask you today, how do you need to respond to the Lord? How do you need to respond to the Lord? We're going to have a moment of prayer and invitation, which is a continuation of our worship. If you're watching us by live stream, if you have questions about how to have a right relationship with God or how to connect with our church, you can send an email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com, info at stonebridgesa for San Antonio.com, and we will set up a time to meet, and we'll talk about that. If you're here today and you do not know where you stand with the Lord and you want to nail that down, you want to receive that gift, please, again, I want you to leave knowing that you know you are in a right relationship with God. We will have counselors here at the front who will be ready to talk with you. And you can just simply say, I, I need to know. I, need, I want to know. Please don't leave without knowing. Or if you want to know how to join with this church, you can come forward and say, yeah, I, I, I want to connect with this church. I want to join with this body. And we'll, again, with either of those situations, we'll set up a time to meet. We'll talk about it. We'll pray. We'll celebrate with you. Or maybe you just need to pray. 
And I'm going to challenge you. If you are a believer in this whole time, you're going, I've already, yes, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. I want you to start praying for, please, the lost people that are in your life. And I want to challenge you to do some specific things this week. One, I want to challenge you not only pray for them daily. Two, I want you to reach out to them. And three, ask God to give you an opportunity to share the gospel, your testimony in the gospel with them. And four, to invite them to services next week. We have good news. It's too good to keep to ourselves. So we're going to continue worshiping. However you need to respond to the Lord, I pray that you would do so. Knowing that you were loved and we're here, we want to bless you. So let's rejoice and respond to the King as we need to. Father, I praise you for your word and I thank you so very much for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you've made it emphatically clear we must be born again. And I ask and pray that you would do that work in our lives, that if there is anyone here present or anyone watching who has not yet been born again, that today would be the day of salvation. And Father, for those of us who profess the name, I pray that you would break our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would break our hearts, that we would understand that we are surrounded by people who are lost and headed towards a Christless eternity, that we would share the good news of Jesus. Lord, be glorified in our lives and the life of this church. And I pray these things in the precious name of Christ. Amen.